As many Subnautica veterans already know, that giant ship in the distance at the start of the first game is the crashed Aurora ship, of which the player character was originally on board before being shot down. The Aurora was initially coming into contact with the planet in order to build a phase gate for faster than light travel to the system, but also there was a top secret secondary mission in order to figure out what had happened to a previously downed ship called the Degassi, a Mongolian vessel Altera had interest in. But upon finding the planet, the Aurora was shot down, and only 25 of the 50 escape pods on the port side were able to be fired before the crash landing. In the actual game, however, only 10 of these pods, including the one we start in as the player, can be found. So this naturally starts to make us wonder, what happened to the other 15 life pods that did in fact successfully deploy from the Aurora? One possibility is that they simply were damaged beyond recognition during the crash landing. Because while they did successfully deploy per the Aurora computer logs, that doesn't mean the massive amount of debris flying in the air after the cannon shot wouldn't have proved fatal for most life pods. The fact that our pod is still in such good condition, for example, is a miracle in and of itself. Another idea is that some of the pods may have crash landed on some of the actual terrain of the planet above water and have been decimated by the impact. This certainly could have been the case because while most of the planet is underwater, there are also large pockets of landmass, as we see in the sequel Below Zero. But one of the most haunting and probably most likely theories is that these remaining 15 life pods actually landed in the hellish void zone. If this were the case, the inhabitants would have been subject to a slow and painful descent, tens of thousands of meters underwater, where some would have been swallowed whole by ghost leviathans on their travel downward, and the unlucky few who made it to the bottom would have been met with the most unbelievable and crazy creatures and fauna in the entire universe, likely doing everything they could to survive before meeting their end, or simply dying instantly due to the high amounts of pressure at those depths. The last theory, and potentially worst of all, is the idea that the life pods were never meant to actually save anyone in the first place. This postulation comes from the fact that our own life pod and all the others we find in game are very, very sparse on resources. Anyone that was in fact trapped in these in space or planet side would need to find other shelter and resources pretty much immediately or meet their certain doom. We already know that Altera is a very evil corporation in the game in many ways, so it begs the question. Could Altera purposely have not put survival equipment in each pod in order to save on cost? After all, it would be much cheaper to just compensate the families for their loss than to fund an entire new expedition through multiple phase gates for rescue, especially in a location where ships are known to go missing. At the end of the day though, we still don't know what happened to the missing Aurora life pods, and if anything, I'm hoping the next installment in the series will finally shed some light on this big mystery. Located deep inside the main aquarium of the disease research facility on planet 4546b, you may have stumbled upon the skeletal remains of an unknown creature. Based on the logs in the facility, we know this fossil is over a thousand years old and was marked during testing as codename Research Specimen Theta. On first glance, the remains of this majestic beast seem to somewhat resemble biters and sand sharks, as all these animals have the same similar eye structure, with two main eyes in the front of the skull followed by a second set just behind them. And it seems this assumption is correct, because in the logs we can find in the game, it confirms this. But for research specimen Theta, the second pair of eyes is much smaller, and because of this, their actual purpose is unknown. Based on all this though, it can be inferred that the biters, sand sharks, and bone sharks that we see today in the world all likely stem from this ancient and mysterious research specimen Theta. Diving deeper into the logs, we can see that this creature also mostly fed on plant life, and likely lived in environments more flush with fauna, which has since largely died out, presumably due to the Cara bacterium outbreak, even though sometimes in the logs we do see that the Cara isn't affecting the fauna. And on top of this, the specimen's large size once again implies that previously on the planet, there were much larger animal and plant life that covered the seas, with entirely different biomes we haven't seen. As to what actually happened to this fossil though, it's hard to say. It's likely that the creature died when the facility went into lockdown and testing was abandoned, leaving him to starve alone in his cage without any friends or family in sight. It's a harrowing thought for sure and shows just how dark the Subnautica universe and lore can really be. While most of the Subnautica main story centers around the crashed Aurora ship, the downed Mongolian cruiser, the Degassi, might be even more interesting. Of its original six crew members, only three survived the crash, 
Paul Torgal and his son Bart Torgal, as well as the woman of the hour, Margaret Maida, a mercenary protecting the ship. They were able to slowly build up a base of operations on a nearby island as well as underwater, but soon realized they had become infected with the Cara bacterium on the planet and didn't have long to live. In order to help their odds of survival, Margaret tracked a Reaper Leviathan back to their base so Paul could study it for findings on the Cara. But sadly, another Reaper Leviathan had followed Margaret and ended up leveling the base. In an attempt to save Paul and Bart, Margaret fought the Reaper Leviathan in her prawn suit as it carried her deep into the void, never again to be seen. That is until Subnautica Below Zero released, where we do actually meet Margaret Maida on Delta Island. It's here we learn that the Leviathan carried Margaret for miles on end through the void, and she only managed to narrowly kill the monster and then swim to the surface. She used the corpse of the monster to make shelter in the middle of the ocean and survived for three weeks until she hit landfall in Sector Zero, otherwise known as Below Zero. This is why later in Below Zero we also are able to find her and speak to her. The real mystery though comes from just what exactly Margaret saw in the void, and more importantly, how she survived with the Cara bacterium now for over a decade. Some theories postulate that Margaret simply is stronger than most people, or has a natural immunity, but for me, that just doesn't make enough sense. After all, most people are dying within a week. Ten years seems excessive. A more likely scenario is that a peeper that had crossed a precursor vent had some of the Enzyme 42 serum on it that helped Margaret survive longer. But in this form, it would not have been a cure, just an aid for some time. So it still begs the question, how is Margaret still alive and kicking almost a decade later? Well, here comes the really interesting lore. Because in Subnautica Below Zero, the zone that a good portion of the map takes place on did not have any Enzyme 42 treatment taking place for over a thousand years. Meaning any and everything should be dead and long gone. But when we arrive, that's most certainly not the case. For example, we can find a fossilized but still alive leviathan that is heavily infected but not dead even after thousands of years. The only issue with this though is if there is something in Sector Zero that is causing a cure for the Kara, why didn't more precursors settle here and why is there no talk of a cure in the logs? The final and potentially best theory is that consuming the Reaper Leviathan's flesh saved Margaret. You see, the only animals in Subnautica that do not show signs of the Kara are a very small handful of the Leviathans, implying that some of them have somehow grown in immunity. Maybe by consuming an entire Reaper Leviathan to stay alive, Margaret also accidentally cured herself of the Kara. My personal issue with this theory though, is if this were the case, how is this not discovered by anyone else by this point? Sure, the Leviathans could be hard to study due to their aggression and size, as we've already seen, but surely by this point someone would have discovered this. For me, the best explanation is that something happened while Margaret was being carried around by the Reaper Leviathan in the void, and she came into contact with a mysterious and powerful something that cured her, something that might be explored even deeper in the void in a future game. One of the most valuable resources in all of Subnautica is the scraps of metal we find everywhere on the ocean floor. These scraps include schematics and upgrades to our ships and homes that allow us to build more advanced machinery that helps us reach the deepest points of the map. The crazy thing about all this metal though is just how much of it there is. Almost everywhere you go on the map, if you are searching for it, you will find lots of metal and even other materials that obviously do not stem from the planet itself and it makes it abundantly clear that lots of people have been here before. The question though is, just how many people is that? It's widely been assumed that most of this material stems from the Crast Aurora ship, and this is also why it's quite recognizable. But could it be that lots of this material is actually from other Crast ships over the last couple of thousand years? After all, the only ships we know that went down are the Degassi and Aurora, but there is no evidence to say that there couldn't have been many more, like say the Mercury 2. One idea I have that I think would be really awesome is that Altera Corporation could have been secretly sending dozens of other ships to the planet on top secret missions that no one knows about, and all have been shot down. So they keep on sending more and more people to the system, telling them they are the first ones going there, when really they are just another sacrifice for Altera to do more research on what's going on. Based on the ending of Subnautica Below Zero, where we get to go to a precursor planet, if this theory is correct, we could find other humans there from other downed ships as well. For those that don't know, Unknown World's two most well-known game series, Subnautica and Natural Selection, actually share the same universe. 
We know this because of multiple crossover references between the two series, with the three most notable being the fact that they both take place within the Ariadne arm of the galaxy, both have an Altera corporation that is building supplies and funding missions, and most importantly, both have a heavy focus on the Kara bacterium. In natural selection though, the Kara are actually an alien life form that has been taken over by the bacterium and has developed new razor sharp talons and weapons and is a massive threat to humanity. And we see other similarities as well, like the Hydra in Natural Selection seemingly being an evolved form of the tiger plant in Subnautica, along with many other similar fauna, and the fact that so many of the aliens in Natural Selection seem to be aquatic life forms from a base. So could it be that Subnautica is actually a prequel to the events that happened here? And what takes place on planet 4546b is the cause for the potential downfall of humanity in Natural Selection. The implications of this are crazy too, because it implies that Kara bacterium actually got off planet 4546b and somehow infected other species that then attack humanity, and what better way would this have happened than the player character Riley from Subnautica 1? You see, when Riley shuts down the planetary defense system and escapes now cured of Kara, it seems like a happy ending for everyone. But what many players don't think about is now that the planetary defense system is down, other ships that travel to 4546b could become infected and still leave, meaning they could spread the virus elsewhere. On top of this, we know from some entries in the game's logs that a very small portion of the Kara bacterium is resistant to Enzyme 42, meaning Riley could have potentially been the host that spread it everywhere, or even if a small fish or animal that was able to sneak on board the ship with him. This means that likely the cause for the all-out war against the Kara aliens in Natural Selection is the direct result of Riley's actions trying to escape the planet to save themselves, likely dooming all of humanity in the process. This theory really puts into perspective just how selfish an act the ending of Subnautica really is, and potentially could lead to a future where only the precursors can save humanity. An interesting way to tie in all the series together, for sure. One of the more out there theories that's gained a lot of traction from the community in Subnautica is the idea that the game actually takes place in the afterlife. The idea for this stems from the fact that during the introduction sequence to the first game, there's actually a moment where Riley, the playable character, is hit in the head by a detached panel from the crash ship and passes out. Sometime later, Riley wakes up and this is where the real game begins, as we escape from our life pod and venture into the deep blue sea. But what if none of this was actually real? and instead that massive and heavy detached panel actually did in fact kill us. It would perfectly explain this very alien planet with unlimited new types of fauna and flora, and would also lend credence to these fantastical alien contraptions we find littered across the map, as everything is nothing more than a dream or the afterlife in the player's head. Even crazier theories argue that because Altera's computers most likely have a tree even crazier theories argue that because Altera's computers have most likely achieved true general artificial intelligence, when the player character dies, the computers would have become extremely bored, not having anyone to boss around and annoy. So they would have used some of Riley's brain matter and cells, along with the fauna in the local environment, to construct a new consciousness that we play as. I swear I'm not high. <laughs> Personally, I don't buy into this one at all though, as I think it's just an easy excuse to be able to retcon away anything if need be. And also, now that Subnautica Below Zero has released and takes place on the same planet, we can be pretty sure that everything we are experiencing isn't just a dream or the afterlife.